Hello! Uh, this video lecture will cover early childhood, the psychosocial aspects of development. Early childhood reflects the ages of 18 months to 3 years. And at this point, what we're looking at is Erickson's crisis of autonomy or independence versus shame or doubt. The main question is, can I master my own body? And this is especially true with potty training. Um, and this is answered as children develop a sense of personal control over physical skills and a sense of independence. The positive outcome is success leads to a feeling of autonomy. Um, and unfortunately, if it is a negative outcome, failure results in a feeling of shame and doubt. The strength learned is willpower and the primary influence are the parents. So during early childhood, and again remember 18 months to about three years old, during this stage we learn to master skills for ourselves. And toddlers learn how to walk, talk, and feed themselves. They're also learning fine motor development as well as the much appreciated toilet training. They have the opportunity to build self-esteem and autonomy as they gain more control over their bodies and acquire new skills, learning right from wrong. And during this stage, the toddler discovers that he or she is no longer attached to the primary caregiver, but is a separate individual. That is an extremely important point, and I want to make sure you guys remember that. This is the point where the child realizes that mom or dad or whomever their primary caregiver is not, in fact, part of them. Overall, what you're seeing is a child's beginning not to necessarily completely detach from mom and dad, but beginning to understand that they have a place in the world that they can explore. Early childhood behavior. Um, and anyone who has ever dealt with a toddler knows that um, it can be one of the most frustrating moments of anyone's life. Um, toddlers autonomous behavior is a way for forming their own identity away from the caregivers. So again, it's not that they're necessarily getting ready to detach from uh, mom and dad, it's they're beginning to form their own sense of self. It is also during this stage, however, that toddlers are very vulnerable. And if a child is shamed in the process of toilet training or in learning other important skills, we may feel great shame and doubt over our capabilities and suffer low self-esteem as a result. It's that idea that I can't accomplish this very important thing that mom and dad want me to do, and so consequently I'm a useless human being. Conflict and early childhood. The strong will of a toddler may cause conflict between the child and the caregiver. Parents who are too assertive and too demanding may find themselves in a power struggle with their child. Keeping in mind that at the cognitive level of a two-year-old, they don't understand compromise. They don't understand give and take. They know what they want and they want it right now. And you as the parent who are putting the boundaries in, you are just being impossible to them in the same way that they are being impossible to their parent. Autonomy is gained for the toddler when given reasonable choices and proper guidance from the caregiver. And obviously, anyone who's ever dealt with a toddler knows this is much easier said than done. But the idea of reasonable choices, if delivered in a consistent way, is going to eventually break through the blockheadedness of your average toddler. From birth, parents and children affect each other bi-directionally. And as such, they construct their relationship based on a variety of variables, such as personality, socioeconomic status, and education. Remember, this is that reciprocal interaction. The child raises the parents as much as the parents raise the child. And this 
collective sense of responsibility and interaction will oftentimes dictate the relationship of the parent and child later on in their lives. So let's look at parenting in general. There are three types of parenting behavior. There is authoritarian and these are demanding parents who expect instant obedience. No consideration is given to the child's wants and needs. And these are the kind of parents who will say, do it my way or else. They don't care what their child wants. They don't care what the child needs. They want to do it their way and they expect you to snap to it immediately. Now on the other scale, on the other side of the scale is what we call the permissive parent. These parents take a tolerant view of their children's behavior. They rarely use punishment or make demands on their children. And children tend to make their own decisions and choices. And again, what we have to remember is that a child does not have the experience or understanding or cognitive understanding of what it is to make good choices. So a lot of times these types of children are making terrible choices and their parents are not influencing them in a positive way. So if a nine-year-old decides he or she would like to start smoking cigarettes and mom and dad are fine with it, think about the long-term implications. The child's going to develop an addiction much, much earlier than he should or she should. There's going to be issues with their friends and peer groups. There's going to be issues with that next level. What do we do when we start smoking? We start drinking. When we start drinking, we try drugs. And these are gateways. And I'm not saying that any of these things are necessarily wrong. But a gateway at age nine is going to be a much different set of circumstances than a gateway opportunity at 14 or 15. Finally, we have what's known as the authoritative parent. And notice that it looks a lot like the first word authoritarian, but it's authoritative. And that is a very important idea. These are the parents who respond to their children's needs and wishes. And when they exert control, they explain the reason for their decision. You're nine years old. You should not be addicted to a substance this young in this kind of a, a scenario. And they encourage their children's independence and expect mature behavior. A lot of times, and again, you know, when you're dealing with children, there's no right or wrong answer for every single child. But understanding that a child is going to grow, is going to detach, and you should, as the parent, expect certain behaviors, being mature about the choices they're making, taking responsibility, allowing their child to express themselves, even if you're not going to give in. So a lot of these things under an authoritative parent is negotiation, discussion, and understanding each other's point of view. Whereas authoritarian and permissive are just basically the parent either taking too much control or giving up too much control. So what happens to children depending on what kind of parenting style they have? Their parents have, excuse me. So with an authoritarian parent, a child will be withdrawn, they will lack enthusiasm, they'll, if they're girls, they're very shy, if they're boys, they're very hostile. So um, young boys who go home to a father who is very aggressive, very loud, argumentative, more likely to smack you across the head than to give you some advice, these little boys grow up to be very hostile young men because that's how they relate to other people because that's how their father or even their mother related to them. They have a low need for achievement and low competence levels. They tend not to be good at things because why bother? They're just going to get punished. Now let's go over to the other side, the permissive. Children's characteristics include being very impulsive. They don't think about the choices they're making. They just make 
um, decisions based on emotional whim. They have very low self-reliance. When they get into trouble, they expect other people to bail them out. They have very low self-control, low maturity levels, very aggressive, again, because they're used to getting what they want, and they lack a sense of responsibility. So as you can see, the two sides, authoritarian and permissive, lead to children that are going to be very challenging to deal with. Then we have the middle one, and this is the one that we should all be aiming for, authoritative. These kids tend to be assertive, which is a good thing, independent, friendly, cooperative. They have a high need for achievement and high competence levels, meaning that they are very good at achieving things and learning things. Ultimately, a parent can only do the best job they can. But if we pay more attention to the kind of parents we are, we can ensure that our children will have the best possible scenario growing up. Now, one of the major issues that a lot of parents deal with and causes a lot of guilt for a lot of moms and dads is child care. The fact is that a majority of children in the United States under the age of five receive some kind of daycare. Now, daycare can be a great thing for children for the following reasons. It aids in motor development with increases in height and weight. Kids are playing and they're playing with each other and they are more active, they're more involved, they are catching up with each other. Think about the idea of the zone of proximal development. A two-year-old who's playing with a three-year-old is going to get pulled along on that scaffolding. Kids tend to get more colds and viruses, which in the long run helps them build a better immune system. They become more independent, but they are still securely attached to their family. And also realize that they're beginning to understand trust also, too, um, you know, that was developed during infancy. They know mom and dad are going to come get them at the end of the day. They know that the very nice teacher is going to make sure they get crayons and get to dance and do all this. So they're beginning to see that the environment outside of mom and dad's house can also be a trustworthy place. Um, cognition skills are advanced. That means they think better. Um, language skills are better. And overall, there's a positive effect on a child's intellectual development. So as much as we feel guilty about having to work to raise our children, the reality for a lot of us is, is that the kids are benefiting way more than we could benefit them by staying home. So what are the characteristics of a quality daycare? And this is stuff you should just know, especially if you're planning on using a daycare in the next few years. One of the most important things to find out is a what is the staff to child ratio? If you have six kids to one staff member, that's going to be phenomenal. But if you have 30 kids to one staff member, there's no way that staff member can pay attention to everybody. Also, is the staff trained and well educated? Um, a lot of times you'll have people who um, are young people in college who are going to school to become elementary school teachers who are working in these facilities and they are learning what they're supposed to be doing in the classroom and putting it to play in the actual daycare environment. Is the environment safe and attractive? Um, are the staff concerned with personal care? Are there supervised motor activities, you know, games, contests, dancing, art projects? Is there attention to language skills? Are there creative opportunities? And most importantly, are social relationships encouraged? One of the most important things we can do for our children is to give them the skills to create good social relationships. Being able to have friends, attach to other people, feel confident in other people is so important because as we get older and we detach from our families, we create a new family. Whether we get married or we have um, a wide circle of friends, these social relationships form the stress relief for most of us. Now let's look at play. 
Because play is one of those things that we just don't do enough as adults, but it seems to be the primary job of little kids. So play is activity that is engaged in for the sheer enjoyment of it. And in 1932, Mildred Parton developed a list of kinds of play, and of course she did this by observing the children. So the first kind is unoccupied play, and this is when children observe other children playing. You oftentimes see this when you get to a playground, and if your child is shy, they may want to step back and watch for a while before they join in. Then there's solitary play. Um, children playing by themselves. You know, some of us, when we were growing up, we didn't have siblings yet, or we don't ever have siblings, and when mom and dad are busy doing grown-up stuff, the child will sit and play with blocks or Barbies or crayons and basically active, um, actively engage their mind by themselves. Then we have onlooker play which is where children watch others play and call out suggestions and encouragement. In this kind of a context, imagine what happens when you're watching um, a Little League game or a Pop Warner football game. The kids who are sitting off to the side are throwing out their own suggestions and ideas. And they are, in a sense, participating in the process of play. Then we have parallel play. This is when children play beside one another, but not with one another. And you often see this with siblings. Um, they will be playing with, you know, the brother might be playing with blocks, the sister might be playing with a doll. They're not playing and engaged with one another, but they are sitting side by side. Then we have associative play. And this is when children play with others, but are more interested in the social interaction of play. So again, now you're beginning to see when kids are eight and nine years old and they're engaged in play, but they're more focused on interacting with one another, talking to one another, discussing things. And then last, we have cooperative play. And this is when children play with others and are actively working towards a goal. Uh, one of the big things that we used to do when I was a kid is we'd go into the woods and we'd build a fort. And all the kids would go around collecting wood and another kid would go out and find rope, steal it from somebody's garage. I, of course, never did that. And, you know, by the end of the afternoon, we had a really sad looking fort built, but we were all very proud of it. Um, so the goal being to build a fort and all of the kids in the neighborhood working together to achieve this goal. So, <clears throat> what kind of play do we engage in and when? So, from age one to two, we engage in what's known as functional play. And these involve simple motor movements, things like walking, jumping, moving cars. Um, you know, when your baby is 18 or 19 months old and they are able to walk, but uh, they tend to bump into a lot of things. Just simple motor movements is enough to get them very excited and happy. Then from ages three to six, we see something called constructive play. And this is where they're creating something. They're playing with Legos, blocks, they're drawing, they're using crayons. Um, this is when they have the ability to create things out of their imagination. As we get a little bit older, we engage in make-believe play. And this is pretending to be someone or something. A lot of times you'll see kids at this age playing house, they play doctor, they play school, they play princess, they play animal veterinarian. They are trying out various roles that they could potentially engage in as older kids. Last but not least, from ages 6 to 11, we tend to see games with rules. And this is where you see kids beginning to play baseball, playing football, soccer, hockey. They understand the rules. It's not just about running around and kicking a ball. Um, baseball, playing cards, board games. These are the, the times that we teach our children how to actively engage with boundaries, those rules, and how to work within those rules. So, why do we like to play? Well, the benefits of play. It's very important. 
They learn to engage in wishful thinking. If you want to be a princess and you can put on your princess gown and your tiara, that's wishful thinking. And you know what? 99% of us will never grow up to be a princess. However, this idea of wishful thinking allows us to explore our imagination. It also helps relieve stress and pressure. It can build self-esteem. It teaches us how to interact socially, which I've mentioned is so important. And it also provides an outlet for painful feelings. So before we finish this particular um, segment, I wanted to talk about Richard Lerner's theory of developmental contextualism. And basically what he said is all of our characteristics, psychological as well as biological, function by reciprocal interaction with the environment. The environment being context or circumstance. And he looks at four specific contexts. The physical setting, your home, your classroom, your workplace. Our social influences, our family, our peers, our significant others our personal characteristics, um, our appearance, our temperament, our language fluency. Um, language fluency is how easily we can communicate with others. Some people are very, very quiet. They do not feel comfortable talking to other people, even people that are in their families. While other people, they'll talk to the wall. They'll talk to strangers. And we all know people like this in our lives, where you're standing in line at Target and your friend is having a long conversation with some per person they met behind them. Last but not least, the context of influence of time. The longer we're alive, the more changes we experience. Um, I am significantly older than most of you, and I have seen a lot of um, how time has influenced not just my own personality, but people in general and our expectations. So this is the kind of scenario where you know, these four contexts determine in large part who we become as adults. So, you know, what is our home life like? Are we in a traditional home with mom and dad and two siblings? Or are we living with a single parent? Um, are we in a classroom with 25 kids? Or are we in a classroom with 45 kids? Do we work in an environment that is productive and healthy? Or do we work in an environment that the boss is a jerk and everything around us is depressing? So a lot of these things will help shape who we are as people. All of these slides will be on the next quiz. Make sure if you have any questions that you email me or text message me. Thank you.